All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on our uh, June webinar. We're, we're excited to have a, a good group of folks here with us today and, and happy to have our uh, presenters, Chuck and Larry from Novazymes. Uh, they're going to be walking us through a uh, case study on, on their the process they've gone through to implement an ultrasound program at their facilities and and the uh, success that they've had and, and how they've gotten there. So we're, we're really excited about that. Before we get started, just a little bit about UE Systems. We've been providing ultrasound solutions for the last 40 years, um, and there's nothing better than when we can s talk with our customers like, like Chuck, Chuck and, Laura, and Larry, rather, um, and hear, hear how they've been able to take the technology and really make really awesome things happen. So uh, we're always happy to, to be supportive of our customers, obviously, and, and then to then hear the, the great stories is, is just a bonus for us. Um, if anybody's interested in a little extra information about UE Systems, we are happy to send this interactive information kit to you. Just shoot me, um, either pop it into the questions box or send us an email and we'll, uh, we'll be sure to send this to you, just a quick, at a glance, um, rundown of everything that we've got going on um, within UE Systems. And uh, before we welcome Chuck and Larry, I just want to do a couple little housekeeping, just so everybody knows we are recording this session, um, just like we do with all of our other webinars, if, if you've participated in the past. And we will be posting uh, the recording of this up on our site. And we will alert all of you that are on the webinar today to when that is up, up and running for you. And also, if at any time during the session you've got a question, um, just pop those into the questions box. And uh, towards the end, I will uh, be able to ask Chuck and Larry those questions for you guys, and, and they can get you those answers. So we want to try to make it as interactive as we can uh, without uh, you know, with everybody being so far away, but uh, hopefully we can accomplish that. So without further ado, I'm going to switch the screen here over to Chuck and Larry, and we'll let them uh, get started. So welcome, Chuck and Larry. We really appreciate uh, you guys being here with us today. Uh, thank you very much. We're glad to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? I think they can. I haven't seen any complaints yet, but I'll keep an eye on it and let you know if we do. Is the presentation showing okay? It is. So you are ready to roll. All right, cool. Well, first of all, my name is Chuck Darrell. I'm the Reliability and Maintenance Manager here at Novozymes, and I'm in here with our PDM Planning and Scheduling Supervisor, Larry Shine. Uh, we'll go through this presentation, give you a brief background on both of us, and then uh, tell you a little bit about our site, tell you a little bit about our company, and uh, go in and tell you what we've been able to do with this ultrasound. So. Uh, First of all, uh, Larry, Larry's been with us for 30, he's been in maintenance for 30 plus years. He's been in uh, with Novazyme since 1997. He's held roles as a uh, maintenance mechanic supervisor. He's been the maintenance supervisor on the floor for 12 years. Uh, he's got an extensive knowledge. Uh, we consider him an expert in planning and scheduling. And Larry actually implemented our PDM team here at Novazyme. Before he came to work for Novozymes, he was with Burlington Industries for 10 years, from 1987 to 1997. And uh, he was also in the United States Navy from 1980 to 1985. Me, uh, I've been in maintenance for 20 plus years. I've been with uh, Novozymes since 2008. Uh, I am the Reliability and Maintenance Manager. Uh, some of my claim to fame here is we have an annual maintenance managers workshop for fuel ethanol plants uh, where we do best practices and knowledge sharing. We're going to be doing the second annual one of those next week. Uh, I've got a, uh, a good background in reliability centered maintenance. Uh, I have a, an associate's degree in electrical engineering technology and a bachelor's in electronic engineering technology. Uh, I graduated from West Virginia Institute of Technology uh, in 1993. I am a CMRP. Uh, before I came to work for Novozymes, I worked for Georgia Pacific uh, for 13 years, from 1995 to 2008. And uh, before that, when I graduated high school, I worked in the mining industry until I got my engineering degree. Uh, Novozymes, we're located in Franklin, North Carolina. We have about 500 employees here at this site. Uh, we produce enzymes 
that's used in all various industries, uh, brewing, baking, animal feeds, uh, fuel ethanol, household care. Uh, it's, uh, it's what gets the proteins out of you and eats the stains out of your clothes. It uh, does all kinds of cool things. Gives your bread its shelf life. Uh, we are a global company. We have locations uh, around the world. We have three sites in Denmark. Uh, which that's where we're uh, headquartered in Copenhagen, Denmark. We have two sites in China, a site in Brazil, and uh, two sites in North America. Uh, one of those sites is in Blair, Nebraska. This is a picture of our facility here in Franklinton. Uh, grown quite a bit since Larry, Larry's been here, and, and uh, a little bit since I've been here. So it's a pretty good site. You can see we're out in a rural area of, of North Carolina, which is, is a a great place to be. Uh, if you look up in the top left corner, you can also almost see my and Larry's tree stand. So uh, we like to do a little bit of hunting back there. What we what we were trying to do whenever we embarked on this journey with the PDM is we wanted a strategy to help better predict the equipment condition. We were using the vibration. We were using infrared, the IR. And we were using ultrasound, but we was just using the ultrasound to find air leaks. So we wanted to see what else we could do. And we wanted to find issues. We wanted to find issues way in advance uh, and utilize the P and F curve to help us out. We wanted to reduce the cost of repairs. And we wanted to reduce the, time, the amount of time it takes to, to do the repairs. And then, of course, reduce the breakdowns. That's, that was the key. And if you can see on the PDF curve there, the earlier you can find it, the more time you have to plan and schedule and the less uh, uh, destructive nature it is. The PDM equipment. We, uh, we actually compared the UE systems against another leading brand uh, to make sure that we was going to uh, choose the right, the right equipment. Uh, and, of course, we did choose the UE 15,000. Some of the reasons behind that was uh, the software. The software is very user friendly, and the customer su customer support were uh, those were the big deciding factors. The UE fifteen thousand has the ability to take pictures that can be tied into CMMS, and that right there was golden for us whenever we was going out and doing this work. Uh, and we'll show you a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and the air savings calculator. The air savings calculator was a big plus also, making sure that uh, we didn't have to spend a lot of time doing the calculations. It, it uh, actually calculates it for us. Uh, we did a, uh, what we call a management justification. And pretty much what that did is it just went in and uh, gave them a good background and you know, told them what the benefits were, told them what it was going to take to do it, pretty much what the costs involved and, uh, and what all we could do with it going forward. So. We realized that, uh, that we could speed things up and help find this stuff a little bit sooner and get it on some routes and do a lot more with the, uh, with the ultrasound. So that's how we sold them on it. Uh, the first major use is we had a, a mixer in our granulation department. And it's just a rotary vessel that's used to condition the granulated enzymes to, uh, prior to transportation to the drying bed. And, uh, we went in, and as you can see there, we had uh, the two main bearings. We had to grease four times a year at that quantity. And then the chopper bearings, we had to grease 12 times a year at that quantity. And that's just what they told us we needed to do. We wasn't, we wasn't sold 100% on it because we were still uh, experiencing failures. And if you, this right here is just the supporting documentation that, you know, from the company that says, hey, this is exactly what you need to be doing with it. So uh, we made sure that we was uh, actually listening to what they was telling us, but we still seen the, uh, the failures. So what was going on was the choppers were failing prematurely, and we was getting about an average of eight failures per year. And with a high cost and very labor intensive to replace these choppers, and we would lose at least four hours of production each time one failed. Of course, it was a breakdown. It was considered a breakdown each time they failed. And, uh, the other thing was that these were time-based PMs, and they were inadequate because the problem was compounded by an erratic production schedule. And what we mean there is, you know, 
we might have been greasing them, you know, once a month, but one month we might be running full board, and the next month we might only be running part of the time. And uh, so that was creating some issues for us also. Uh, the faults and failures, uh, you can see on these, uh, it was the FFK 35 B, C, and D granulation choppers, and they have a history of not only frequent failures, but they were random. We couldn't predict when they was, when they was coming. We've seen that these were mainly due to improper lubrication. And when the failure occurred, it shut down the entire production operation in that building until we could get the repairs made. Just the materials alone cost us about $4,000, and it cost us about $500 in labor. Four hours lost production was about $60,000 there. So really, by, by going in and fixing this, every time that we avoided one of these failures, we had a cost avoidance associated with that of about $65,000. So just to sum it all up, you know, we went in, we listened to the bearings, and we recorded a sound file what was going on. We went in and, and lubricated the choppers utilizing the UE15000 until the DBs remained constant where we wanted them. And we realized that some of the bearings required 15 pumps of shots of grease lubrication. Some of them required as much as 60, so we was way on both ends of the spectrum. So after we got them in line, we created a new sound file to use as a baseline. We went in and we monitored these choppers twice a, twice a week looking for changes to make sure everything was still, still working, and we would lubricate those choppers once a week to get them back in line. Once we, get, once we felt comfortable with all this, we reevaluated the program, and now we're lubricating every two weeks. Uh, this right here is just a little picture of the choppers and one of our technicians. And I, we put some. This is uh, uh, the base. <laughs> and then this right here is after uh, after he lubricated it. see a big difference there. This right here is just how uh, the functionality of the software goes and it, and it just enables you to go in and list your equipment out, store your files, and be able to, uh, to actually have a, a good functional program to work off from. And this is just what the what the technicians see on the screen whenever whenever they do that. This right here is just a, a basic chart of the costs on those choppers in that building. And you can see from 2008 to 2009 that we cut the cost in half. Larry went in and realized that the bearing fits in those choppers wasn't right. So uh, we did some machine work. We cut the cost down drastically, but we were still seeing a, a pretty good cost to repair those in 2009. Uh, in 2010, we went in and actually put in some new choppers, some new mixers. So that's why you don't see any costs associated with 2010. But then again, in 2011, we can see that the cost for maintenance come right back. We were still seeing the failures, even though we had new mixers and new choppers. In there. So 2012 was when we implemented this program, and we started uh, taking a look and seeing what we could do with this uh, ultrasound equipment. And the only reason you see a purple purple square there in 2013 is we just put a, a couple of dollars in there just to show you that uh, there is actually a, a, a column there, but we haven't, we haven't experienced any uh, maintenance costs due to failures in that, uh, in, in on that equipment yet. Some of the uh, additional things that we've been able to do or accomplishments is uh, when we were starting up our facility in Blair, uh, they were having some difficulties with some evapor evaporators. They had some leaks and they, uh, they needed a, a way to be able to fix them and get them back up and running real quick. So we actually sent our, uh, one of our PDM technicians out there, uh, and he was able to go in and troubleshoot with that UE15000, and he realized that the vacuum was inadequate, uh, and uh, we shouldn't be having that many leaks. He identified multiple leaks that day. And uh, the repairs were made and the evaporators back up and running. So that was a pretty good win for us on the equipment. And I think since then, 
they've actually went out and bought their own equipment uh, to do the uh, checks with now. Uh, this right here was a salt fan bearing lubrication that we, uh, it, it was a uh, avoided cost that we've seen. And uh, what we went in here, and as you can see here on this cost worksheet, this is something that management likes to, uh, you know, they'll say, well, maybe that what the worst case, what's the likelihood of the worst case happening? So this is just a weighted average. You can see you can put in the probability of a minor, a moderate, or worst case. So if you catch it early, you know, it's not going to be as near a cost. If you let it go a little bit further to a moderate case, it's going to cost you more. And then, of course, if you let it go until it have, actually has a failure, then that's when your cost is going to be up. So uh, this is just one of our quick wins to where we actually have a, a avoided cost of $81,585 by finding uh, the salt fan bearing uh, before it actually shut down. We'd actually seen this failure before, and uh, it shut us down for uh, you know several days. This is the salt fan that uh, uh, we lubricate with. And this is uh, this is listening to some of the bearings. So I'll give you a before and an after. This is the before. Also used it on the uh, what we call the granulation of the micro fluid bed. Uh, production couldn't get the fluid bed up and running. They uh, they called maintenance for some support to see what we could do to help them. Just off the of, you know just first off come to Larry's mind. Let's send the PDM guy down there with UE and see you know see what we can do. So uh, he decided to use the UE and search for the vacuum leaks. Uh, he went and found all kinds of leaks that day. They, they found that. That you couldn't have found them with any other method. You couldn't hear them. You couldn't see them. Uh, it was just uh, the hidden leaks were, were just embedded in the equipment. Once they found them, they repaired them and got the bed back up and running. So that was a that was a good quick win for us on the on the UE system again. Uh, one of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier is the air leak identification. Uh, this is actually a picture that the guys take with the 15,000 when they're out there and they identify the leak. They take it, uh, they record the, the DB level of it, the date, the time, and whenever they put in a notification into our CMMS, they actually will uh, send this picture to the planner and the planner uh, knows exactly where the leak's at so he don't have to go out there and refind it or, or get them to take him back. He can actually take this picture and uh, identify what he needs and plan the work order, make him, him more efficient also. Uh, this is, you know, how they store it in the software. Uh, you can see there's all kinds of pictures in there and it's tied to those machine points. So you can go back and, and document this store, total it all up. Uh, this right here is the air leak savings calculator. And uh, this is just where you go in and you put in the uh, all the locations you type, we actually added a column to type to work order or work notification numbers. And you can tell you, it, it, it'll tell you how much money that you're losing with these leaks. And uh, once you fix them, it'll actually document that also. So uh, this is pretty good stuff. And after the, uh, we did the presentation in uh, Clearwater, we actually realized that they have, they're going to uh, develop a steam leak calculator to help us also. So that'll be a, a big plus to our program when that is developed. So uh, you can see as we uh, implemented the better air leak routines around the facility, we identified uh, the following savings in areas. And you can see that uh, total avoided cost is uh, right at $60,000 in the facility. And this is an ongoing program, so you know air leaks don't you don't you stop them, but there's new ones popping up all the time. So as we continue to roll, this is uh, 
this is something that's not just a one time and out deal. It's a, it's a continuous uh, savings that we're helping provide. Uh, we got about 250 steam traps around our site. Uh, we contracted a steam trap survey uh, and it showed that about $64,000 potential in energy savings per year. So with our confidence in what we've done so far with the UE system, uh, it's inspired us to inquire into the steam leaks more in depth utilizing the UE equipment. And that's part of what we went to Clearwater for is to find out what other people were doing with that. Uh, and we, we got some pretty good knowledge uh, from the the gentleman from Louisiana, he, uh, he has pretty good stuff going on. And then we found out that they're going to have to develop that uh, steam trap savings calculator also. So uh, we, we brought back some good stuff to help grow our program. Continuous improvement learning. Uh, we didn't get it right the first time on all of it. And we wanted to make sure that you know everybody knows that uh, it's, it's a continuous improvement effort. We developed a sound file for our uh, 36 APO1 ultra filtration pump in November. We put it on a quarterly PM, but uh, before the next PM kicked out, there was an audible noise noticed uh, without the UE equipment. So uh, that's what caught us by surprise. And then we recorded another sound file in March and noticed that there was a large difference. So, so uh, what we realized is that if we put a monthly PM in, uh, we'd have had a gradual increase and we would, would have been able to identify this and catch it before a major failure occurred. But by doing the, uh, by trying to push it out to a quarterly PM too quick, uh, it sort of caught us off guard. And uh, so we went back and adjusted that PM and, and learned a lesson from that. Uh, the next steps where we want to take our program next is uh, the electrical noise, the corona, and the tracking. Uh, we actually uh, we picked up some good knowledge on that also while we was in Clearwater. Uh, there's a lot of potential there to go out and use this to find issues in the switch gear, especially the larger switch gear where our flash is an issue nowadays. Uh, we can go in and uh, and actually utilize this to help eliminate and make our guys safer before they open up any cabinets. Uh, that way if there's, a, if there's a hidden rattlesnake in there getting ready to bite them, they can hear it before it gets them. And uh, we want to send our guys back to level two training and like to get, get to know more about the sound files and what we're doing there. Uh, and to find out how else we can, uh, we can use the sound files. And uh, I guess with that, we'll open it up with questions, Marie. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. That was all really good information. And um, I guess I neglected at the beginning to mention, though, though we had put it in the invite um, when Chuck was making reference to Clearwater. Uh, both Chuck and Larry were in uh, Clearwater for Ultrasound World last month. Um, and so that's what he was referring to, the, the conference and the different presentations. And we were happy to have them actually present this to us down there. And, and it received such rave reviews. We thought, why not uh, open this up to a bigger audience? So um, if anybody has any questions, I've had a few come in. So we'll get those uh, now. But feel free to keep uh, popping them in. We do have some time here. Um, so, Chuck, a question that came in, um, one of them was, with your program, how many different points are you taking um, readings on? And are you recording a DB and sound file every single time? Or how, you know, maybe a little bit more about how exactly your program is set up. I'll, I'll let Larry field that question for us. As far as uh, how many points we take it all, we take it on uh, the starting from the non-driven end of the motor, of course, one on the non-driven end of the motor, one on the driven end of the motor, then, of course, the input on a pump, for instance, and then the output bearing on the pump. Uh, um, we learned a lesson. That's actually a very good question. Do we take sound files every time? Part of the problem that we had on one of the pumps that we had is we took a sound file in November and then just went out there and did regular uh, uh, PM on it just to, to grease it, but didn't take a sound file in December, 
didn't take a sound file in January, and then one of the operators heard the pump making a louder noise than normal. So when we, we went out there, which was, uh, I think, uh, three months after we did the original sound file, of course, we could hear the noise, too. Then the ultrasound, he took the sound file with the ultrasound, and it led us to believe that if we had been taking sound files in December and January, we would have noticed a progressive uh, dB increase or, or, or some kind of a, a, a noise difference in the sound files, which would probably have led us to detect it quicker. So now everything, every time we visit a piece of equipment, we do take sound files. Okay, great. Um, another one that came in, so you talked obviously a lot about using the ultrasound as part of a um, lubrication program. Did did you also find that that caused you to rethink or reevaluate the actual lubricants you were using, um, or did it turn out that, that what you had was, was working just fine? No, I think the lubricants that we have were just fine. I think that we found that um, the frequencies, frequencies were terribly off. I, I think we actually thought that getting the getting the UE fifteen thousand was going to make it where we could reach the bearing less often, but it wound up being it wound up not being the case. We actually visit the bearing more, the visit the equipment more often, especially prop, problem equipment like the choppers that we were shown that we have very little problems with now. When we did it years ago, we went from quarterly to monthly, and now every other week we visit them. We don't reach them as much every time we visit them, but we visit them more often. So the lubricant stayed fine, the frequency definitely changed. Okay. Um, and then someone wants to know how many employees that you've got trained on the equipment and what training they attended, and then do you have different employees trained to do, you know, different applications with it, or, or do are they all trained on doing the lubrication and doing the, the steam and so on and so forth? Uh, right now we have, I'd say, two that are, well, they're, they're level ones, but of course, you know, we haven't been doing it long enough where I'd say they're experts at it, but they're getting better and better every day. Um, we have three PDM technicians all together on the PDM, of course, we do vibration analysis, ultrasound, uh, infrared, and, and oil sampling. But two of them, two out of them three, are, are pretty much um, our ultrasound guy. The third guy, he can do some ultrasound, but not locking up like the other one. But the other two do do uh, all of it. They can do the air, the, air, the uh, vacuum leaks, and the uh, the Okay, and uh, that that kind of answered one person's question, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. They were wondering about you know if you guys were using vibration, and if so, you know how you how you see that those two complement each other, or or are you using them to complement one another? Maybe you could talk a little bit about your vibration program and how it relates to the ultrasound. As, as far as vibration goes, you know we haven't eliminated vibration. We're still using it on the critical equipment. Uh, but what we're finding is a lot of times you can go out there and when you do the uh, record with the UE, the ultrasound, you know, you're doing like Larry said, the input point, the output point. You're not hitting as many points, but uh, you can do it quicker and you can find it sooner, but it might not be quite as accurate. So then you can come back and follow up with a vibration uh, to help pinpoint it or you can follow up with a, a, an IR scan to help see maybe if it's creating heat. Uh, but as far as uh, eliminating any programs, no, it just, they all, the ultrasound finds it quicker, uh, but the other two come back in and complement it and help you monitor it and pinpoint it to sort of help, sort of help gauge uh, how much time you got before it's a catastrophic failure. Okay, great. I think the jury's still kind of out on it because there was some interesting stuff that I mean, Chuck both opened our eyes at it. Clear water, I forget that guy that made the presentation on the UE. Yeah, I think his name is Chuck also, but I don't remember his last name. Yeah. He, he, was, he was very, he was excellent. He had his own business and stuff like that. He, and he went away from uh, vibration analysis and just, just purely 
ultrasound now. So uh, there was some there was some questions that def definitely uh, opened my eyes when we was down there from some of the presenters. So I have, I, I'm gonna have to research that a little bit more. Yeah, I think uh, what you hear you talking about was uh, Chuck Peterson. Um, okay. Yep. Yep. So. Uh, I talked to him a lot after the uh, lecture that he gave, and some of the stuff that he was telling me and another guy kind of was exactly what we're experiencing here. So we're, we're kind of looking into that a little bit more because it, it's uh, have a lot of similarities with other patients. Great. So we've got a couple questions that are kind of related um, from a few different folks, kind of talking more in in terms of the timeline so you know about how long it took to really get things revved up and get this program moving and how long was it before you really saw the results you were hoping to see and and kind of seeing that return on the investment and the equipment um, maybe you could just touch on that again well with air leaks and the and the uh simple chart that you got, you, you can almost say that it paid for itself just by doing that. We found that, I think we had over $70,000 worth of air leaks. 60, 60. Yeah, 68, something like that. We had quite a few air leaks that if they were repaired was, was 60 to $70,000, somewhere in that range right there. So that by itself justified the uh, UE 15000 and that was just for the first year. Um, getting the program up and running, we have a very good CMMS system, so our functional locations were pretty easy. And then we also had Adrian come in, and Adrian helped us out a lot with getting that stuff in the system. We had a vibration program already, so our critical equipment list was already identified, which would be, depending on the size of your plant, would be you know, between you and the only department, what, what they think is critical, of course, they might think everything is critical, but you've got to kind of you develop a critical equipment list and then have Adrian kind of help you with that. He's a great effort. And actually, we, we bought more than one, one UE system. We bought a couple of them because we wanted to get them in each one of our PDM guys' hands as a tool to go out there and develop with. So uh, that wasn't just, that was actually, we justified buying three of them. Great. Um, so just a couple more here. They, they do seem to kind of keep popping in. Um, this one's a little bit longer, but I'll, I'll just read through it as it, as it is here. Um, wondering if you can elaborate on why your regulators were leaking air. Did you find that they were purposely opened and left open, or was it a failure in the regulator itself? And was the buildup of water into the lines reduced upon fixing the leaks and closing the valves? kind of a mouthful, but <laughs> there you go. No, actually we did find out that with a lot of our uh, our um, instrument air boxes that were the age, we're having some O-rings that have just, I guess, dry rotted and they're reaching their age limitations. So that's one of the reasons. I don't know where the water in the air thing came from. Yeah. You know, every now and then, you know, uh, we'll have a desk and dryer that's not working right, and we'll get a little bit of air in the system and stuff. But I don't think that was the cause of the leaks. I think, you know, the main part of it was just due to age on the regulators, the O-rings. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there was some of them out there that was out of adjustment, but uh, we really haven't did a study or a trend as far as what the major causes were. We just want to get them fixed and save that money. Great. Um, another question came in kind of similar to the lubrication one. Um, did you find that you ended up making any changes to the type of bearings that you've been using or the, the provider of your bearings? Did anything change with that as a result of this program? No. No, we, we, we still uh, stayed pretty much with, uh, with the bearings that we were using, so that didn't affect that any at all. One of the biggest things to go back to what Chuck had maybe mentioned a little bit before that, if you see, if you look at that chart where we had the biggest drop, bearing fits seemed to be uh, one of our biggest culprits. And we had learned that in the past that if you loosen up the fits a little bit, especially in high, high speed application, that it can help, but you've got to be very careful from if you don't go too loose. And there's, there's a wide variety of ranges you can go in, and we kind of experimented until we actually bought a honing stone 
and when we got the, the bearing houses back here, we honed it to where we thought it should be, and then we kind of ran tests on them until we got them exactly the way we wanted them. So fairing fits were more important than the fairing manufacturing. Gotcha. Okay. Um, another one came in. Um, they're wondering if you have been using this, and I'm not sure that you are, but have you thought about, um, if you aren't, using this program on hydraulic systems? We don't have a whole lot of hydraulic systems in our uh, in our plant. We have some, uh, but yes, that's that's another area. Uh, of course, I, to me personally, I think uh, an infrared signature is probably going to uh, pick up stuff maybe a little easier on the uh, on the hydraulics to start with, uh, until you get maybe really, really good with the UE stuff, then you might be able to find the the, 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 the bypassing or the blow by. I think you can get a check valve leaking by, a pilot valve leaking by, stuff like that. But no, we don't have enough hydraulics where we've done that, but we did learn about it. At the, at the yeah, so I'll kind of use that as a, a quick uh, spot to put in a, a little uh, plug. Um, we did have a presentation at Ultrasound World, as Larry just mentioned, about utilizing um, ultrasound on hydraulic systems, and it was really, really great information. And we, we videotaped all of those sessions, and we're in the process of getting those up on our website. So for those that are interested in that and learning a little bit more about how you could um, utilize the technology on those systems, that's a good presentation for you to track down here in a couple days. Um, we'll hopefully have it up there for you. Um, back to these, the questions kind of keep coming in, Chuck and Larry, so hope maybe we'll just ask just a couple more and then um, if, if additional questions come in, maybe we can just email those to you and we can get those answered offline. But um, I thought this one was a good one to get in, get in here before we wrap it up. Um, they're wondering if you're spending more, or less, or the same amount of resources, hours and labor, proactively using the ultrasound compared to the PMs that they've replaced. We, we're in a, a, a big push right now to do PM optimization, uh, looking at just how we do all of our PMs. So. I, that would be a hard one to answer as far as how much we saved as far as PDM goes. But I can tell you this, as far as the, uh, uh, the lubrication and stuff goes, the critical equipment, we do pretty much all that now with the UE stuff, so we took that off from our normal guys on the floor. We dedicated the resources to it, and uh, you know their backlog, they maintain a backlog of about four weeks, so they're out there and they're staying busy. Uh, but of course, when they implement the routes and stuff, and instead of, you know, giving a guy a PM to go out there and lubricate something, and it taking him, you know, anywhere from 15 uh, to 30 minutes, then it will, uh, he can go out there and just hit it in a route, and it will speed things up that way. So uh, it does eliminate some, but the biggest thing is it speeds it up by being able to group things together a little easier and put them in routes. Well, it also saves time and that's not having to make a repair. I mean, if you look at the chopper, we haven't made any repairs at all this year, not all wood, but, I mean, if I had to do them last year 10 times, that, that's quite a bit of, of repairs and downtime that we avoided by putting them people on the UV gun. So, I don't, I don't quite know how to calculate that. Okay. Well, I think this was this was really great, and obviously all the discussion it churned up with with the the questions that kept coming in. Obviously, this is uh, good information that people were were anxious to see. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, to come and share this this story again with us, and and we hope uh, we can have you guys back again. You know, maybe next year, and and hear all the great things you're going to do now with with the electrical and, and the other applications that you're planning to uh, implement here in the near future. So thank you guys very, very much, and uh, we'll, we'll help you continue to see great success with, with what you guys are doing. Right. Well, we appreciate the opportunity, and uh, like I say, you know, if, you, if you have any more questions, just get them all together, shoot me and Larry an email, and we'll do our best to answer. All right, we'll do it.
So before we um, finish up completely here, just a couple more little housekeeping notes for, for everybody um, that's still on. Um, as always, we, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, and, and there were some questions, so obviously folks who trickled in a little later, we, we are recording this session um, just like we do with all of our webinars, and uh, we will post it up on our website um, in a couple of days once we get it all, you know, rendered and everything, and we will email you guys to let you know when it's up, so if you need to check a couple slides again or, or maybe share it with uh, someone in, in your organization that you're trying to convince uh, to get, get something like this started, you'll, you'll have that opportunity. Um, and also hope you'll you know, keep an eye on our website because like I said, all of our webinars and we hold, hold these every month are all up there as a resource to you to, to view on your own time. Um, the videos, as I mentioned, from this year's Ultrasound World Conference are going to be trickling up there as we get them back from the, the videographer, so another great resource. And uh, just all the other, you know, articles and white papers and everything that we have. So we, we really do try to be a resource for, for you guys. Um, so hopefully you, you find that to be the case. Um, in addition to all of that, we're trying to stay active with everybody, um, even when we're not on the phone with you or on a webinar. So hopefully you, if you're not already a member of the Ultra Probe Users Group on LinkedIn, we hope you'll join that. Just a great place to, to share information and ideas and questions with, with your peers. Um, we're on there trying to, to help out when we can, but we, we do find that some of the best discussions are the ones between um, just our, our users bouncing ideas off of each other. So, so it's a really great forum to, to get some of those conversations going. We're also on Twitter. We also have our um, Sound Advice blog, so we hope you'll check that out. The, the blog is kind of a more casual place for us to get some sometimes more fun information out there. We've got our Sherlock headphones series of, of blog posts that are up and we've got a, a new one up about uh, the cruising industry. So uh, hopefully you can check that one out and have a little fun with that. And uh, some important dates to keep in mind. We've got, like I said, our webinars every month. You'll see here we've got, we've got them planned out through the fall. Uh, v. Guidry from DuPont is going to be coming next month. Um, he was one of the, the folks that Chuck and Larry just referred to um, his presentation at Ultrasound World was was really great. So we've asked him to come and give us an update uh, next month on how things are going at DuPont with their ultrasound program. Um, and then you'll see we've got uh, a session on managing metrics in August with Tim Dunton. And uh, Mike Gayhoff of uh, GP Strategies is going to be coming and doing a session on planning and scheduling in September. And then uh, you heard them talk about it. Um, they they uh, enjoyed the, the conference very much, Chuck and Larry. So we hope you'll mark your calendars for our 10th annual Ultrasound World next May 13th through the 16th uh, in 2014. So um, we've got that, starting to get that in the works, and, and hopefully everybody can make a, make a point to be there. And with that, I'll leave our kind of contact information up here. And hope everybody has a great afternoon. And anything you guys need from us, just let us know. This is how you can get in touch with us. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, have, a, have a great afternoon.